views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello, welcome to the Social Justice Forums. I am Darren Hyman. Of course, we're going to be bringing you a forum that's discussing some of the social issues that are actually are plaguing and affecting our community a deeper understanding of the inequities that many people face. And then sometimes we want to present multiple points of view in our show, giving you an opportunity to find out what people's perspective actually is. We also promote civic engagement. So we encourage you to stay tuned because the Social Justice Forum starts now. and anxiety about COVID-19 and what could happen can be very, very, very overwhelming. Social distancing guidelines are making people feel isolated and lonely, which increases people's stress and anxiety. In addition, COVID-19 has also brought to surface many racial inequities in the United States. Black people are dying at a disproportionate rate due to the virus and also recent extreme police brutality and violence. It layers on top of the intergenerational trauma of racism rooted in slavery, mass incarceration, police brutality, and then also black oppression. Joining us to provide a point of view on this matter, I'm joined by psychotherapist and founder of the Association for Trauma Outreach and Prevention, Meaningful World, a type of meaningful world, Dr. Ani Kalajian. And we thank you so much, Dr. Ani, for being with us. Thank you so much. Good morning, Pastor Jaime. Uh, this is again, uh, uh, yet again, I, I may sound like a broken record. I felt the shock and disbelief, and I said, this must be old news, and I just tried to uh, pass over it and, and click over it, and uh, uh, no avail. It, it just really broke my heart so much, and then uh, the after effect, afterwards, when I read more about the Wisconsin shooting. And uh, we talked about this, you know, less than a, a month or so ago, uh, uh, Darren. And uh, it's still for me a very, very uh, painful, very uh, tragic moment uh, that we have to repeat the story instead of moving on, building on uh, uh, sound infrastructure that's based on respect and pulling one another up and, uh, acknowledging the past trauma of slavery and uh, expressing remorse and, and uh, asking for begging for forgiveness. Now we found ourselves with this shocking news in the broad daylight and repeatedly shooting. I was like, stop, stop, stop. The man is not doing anything, going to his own car. What's right. wrong with you? Uh, what is the psychology and psyche of the police and uh, we talked about this in terms of uh, training and uh, helping the police to uh, be mindful sometimes because uh, Pastor Jaime if you are traumatized yourself sometimes you don't know what you're doing so I'm wondering are they traumatized are they seeing a lot of uh, uh, traumatic uh, situations that are getting numb to it uh, we have, uh, uh, remember the program we had, a panel uh, with the person who was training the police from John Jay College, Dr. Maki, and uh, she was like also hopeless about uh, the training that we were talking about. Well, let me jump in here and talk about this for a second, Dr. Palaccio, because well, for those of us who are just joining and talking, we're talking about the shooting of Jacob Blake in Wisconsin. Uh, he was shot on his way to a car after an altercation, uh, not at all, well, uh, somewhat of an altercation that we understand with police officers, uh, shot in front of his children, uh, shot in the back, uh, currently paralyzed from the waist down, and yet another trauma that America has been forced to deal with in broad daylight. Dr. Ani talked about broad daylight. What exactly does that look like? Well, when you look at Ahmaud Aubrey, that took place in broad daylight. When you look at George Floyd, that took place in broad daylight for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And now to look at Jacob Blake being shot to seven times uh, in the back uh, by police officers, uh, again, in broad daylight. Uh, there's something to be said, Dr. Ani, about the trauma. There's something to be said for a mindset of people 
because we're highly traumatized. We're watching this on video, first of all. And second of all, as you said, this is a video that's being done in broad daylight. And when you watch something in broad daylight, there are some subliminal messages that one takes and feels traumatized about. Most definitely, it traumatized me. And I know a lot of my friends kept on calling me, did you see this? Did you see this? And uh, my body was having a, uh, uh, like an earthquake reaction, hypervigilant and re-traumatization uh, because I come also from a uh, uh, trauma of my father from Ottoman Turkish genocide. So that doesn't really go away. Of course, I manage it, I work on it, and uh, I, I'm uh, um, teaching about it. And we have uh, free support groups every Thursday trying to help people lift one another up. And we have done so much positive work. People were feeling empowered. People were feeling we can do this. And uh, Black Lives Matter, of course, all lives matter. But at this point, this, this you know, uh, people of color have been uh, experiencing uh, extreme levels of uh, trauma, both personally as well as collectively, as well as repeatedly when we view it is there is no way but one would not feel vicariously traumatized. And it's really challenging at times where we are also dealing with COVID-19, the economic hardship, the emotional um, outcome of COVID-19 that's isolating, depressing, and debilitating people. Suicide rates are high, much higher, 30 to 50%. Depression and anxiety are as high as 50 to 60 percent, depending in communities. Of course, communities of color have also more of these traumas because of the two pandemics merging and uh, creating this explosion, tsunami of uh, after effects uh, tr that traumatizes us even more. When we talk about the trauma, not just the trauma associated with shootings, but also we know about COVID-19. We're not out of this yet. We're still dealing with it. We're dealing with soft reopenings. We're dealing with places across the country that are actually closing up doors now, realizing that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is really affecting their community. Um, talk to us about this, because for us, we talked since March um, in New York when uh, our doors started to shut down, but here we are, and we're talking about September, and we're still seeing uh, things and, and no real easy end in sight. The psychological trauma and the, uh, in, in the, in the effect of dealing with COVID-19. Give us a little bit about ways that people can kind of like cope and handle during this time. Yes, that's a very good question because uh, we have very step-by-step uh, um, -step helpful um, hints, helpful strategies to uh, transform this uh, mega isolation. Um, and I would like everyone to stop calling it social distancing. We cannot, we're a social being. We cannot distance ourselves socially. We're physically distancing temporarily to protect one another. That's a huge difference. We need each other socially to connect and to appreciate and to love and to uh, uh, in many other ways, uh, show our solidarity with one another. So we first must keep our routine. I don't want to hear this day pajama and night pajama. I want everybody to have the same work schedule, wake up uh, as you did before COVID and get dressed, put your makeup, shave, uh, uh, do everything that you were doing before. Don't get into the rut of uh, moving from the bedroom to the other room with your pajamas and not paying attention to self-care. Self-care is very, very essential at this time. So keep your schedule strictly, uh, abide by it very strictly. And then during your breaks, come outside and walk in the park, in, the, in your garden, in, in your streets and enjoy fresh air because going from one room to another staying indoors all day is not good for COVID because we need the vitamin D. We need the vitamin D not only from the sun,
but we need the supplements. Please take them uh, as much as you can. And I want you also to take something else that also protects your immune system. It's called L-lysine. It's a natural amino acid. And I take it and it doesn't, when you take it, you don't even get colds. It really strengthens your immune system. Try to include in your juicing ginger and cardamom and uh, turmeric and, uh, and a lot of uh, berries so that you can drink that. That would help support you. And sleep in regular times, whatever time you were sleeping before. Because when you're not sleeping between 12 and 5 is the most important hours of sleep, quality REM sleep. So don't tell me you're staying up until 4 and then you sleep until noon. You're going to be groggy and you're going to feel more anxious and depressed. It does not work with us. You need that quality sleep. And uh, um, try new things. Some people are reporting cooking with their kids, engaging their kids, because children also are bored out of their minds without their friends. You know, this is a very, nobody's talking about this, but this is very challenging for children because children are moving through developmental stages and every month and every year is very crucial for them. They have to go through certain steps. They have to establish friendship. So if they're not seeing one another, they're missing out on that. So you need to creatively engage with Zoom parties and FaceTime talks with their friends to help them bond and create that friendship that is very important for our development. And organize your closets, your house, your drawers, organize and clean your environment, declutter. That environment is very important because we shape the environment, but then the environment shapes us and gives us the emotional feelings. If it's cluttered, we feel anxious and angry and fidgety, but if it's really nice and organized, we feel relaxation and contentment and happiness. And try to also do things that you wanted to do all the time, you didn't have the time for especially reading, non-professional, like fiction or whatever your desires are, creating YouTube films, we all need to learn. So if you found something interesting, create it, share it with us. So all this creativity and engagement and the schedule keeps us focused, healthy, and anxiety-free. If we talk about loneliness though, because you're giving us some help here, but loneliness is very real during this time. And you talk about the kids and what they have to go through. The kids feel a sense of isolation. Um, adults feel a sense of isolation. And I've talked to some very, you know, high profile professional people and, and, and they're feeling, you know, the sense of cabin fever and loneliness. Um, and so overcoming that and dealing with that, that's a big challenge that we all have to face. What do you say? I mean, you gave us some things right there, but what do you say to that whole issue of loneliness? Yes, that is huge. And that's why I mentioned about uh, keeping strict schedule because this isolation, uh, physical isolation is causing social isolation. That's why I said words are very powerful. Be mindful, don't call it social isolation and promote another problem. Just call it what it is, which is physical isolation. Yes, we can't have big parties of 50 people or over 50 people, but you can have a small gatherings in the park. You can ask your friends to meet in this park. They come with their mask and with the physical distancing and everybody brings something to eat and you share this time together in a safe place in a park. So try not to be very paranoid and strict about your isolation because you do need to expose yourself and be around other bacteria or else your immune system is not working well. The immune system needs uh, exercise and experience. So you cannot keep yourself in a room that's not healthy for you. So think about ways you can engage in a park, uh, walking, hiking. Uh, when I go hiking, I call friends and say, I'm 
going walking in this park and some people who can or are not afraid are coming out and joining in walking. So we're doing something we love. We're uh, embracing nature and connecting with Mother Earth. And then we're seeing our loved ones that we haven't seen for six months. So it's, you have to start doing that. We cannot continue being isolated in our own homes like prisoners. What are you hearing with yourself? I've asked you know all the guests, what are they hearing in a time like this with people who have boots on the ground in the psychological field. What are we hearing from uh, people that maybe uh, us in media and us as a community are not really paying attention to? What is uh, the media not paying attention to? Mm -hmm. Yes, the media can use more programs like yours, uh, Perspectives, uh, Pastor Hines, where, <laughs> where you're giving tools to people, you know, how to. We love to have lists, right? You know, do this, do that, do that, do that. And that gives us order. Order gives us comfort and, uh, and releases the anxiety and brings us together. Oh, this is what Dr. Ani said. Oh, okay, I'm gonna try that. And uh, we have weekly support group. People can come and join and uh, ways, we're trying to find ways and media can do a lot more by giving the recommendations, sending list of things. This is how you can feel connected. This is how you can uh, feel that you're not isolated. We are here with you. And these are like, we have Zoom yoga classes, for example. Now I started doing yoga classes. I, I teach yoga. I'm doing it in my garden where people uh, can be six feet uh, apart and they still uh, exercise, get the fresh air and feel like they are part of community. The same thing with the senior centers. They are too doing activities outdoors. So media can step up and share these good stories where people are, in spite of physical isolation, they are doing things to connect us socially. Yeah, we... <coughs> Excuse me, because social distancing is deadly. It will really wipe out the human race. You talk about social distancing, very, very, very important, but unfortunately, a lot of people don't engage uh, in social distancing because they feel as though it's not important. It's not important to wear a mask. It's not important to, to socially distance, or even worse, the virus isn't that serious because not that many people have died. I mean, these are things that people are, people are actually saying, but when we talk about being in New York and seeing the amount of deaths and seeing the trauma and still seeing the lasting effects um, post-COVID, uh, and we're not even in post-COVID, but to say post-COVID, the worst part of, uh, of, of, of hitting the top, it's still a lot to, to, to contend with. People are not really taking this too serious. Yes, there is the other side where one, you know, Pastor Jaime, this COVID thing and the safety and security issue is like a spectrum. On one extreme, you have people who are extremely fearful, paranoid, they're not coming out of their houses, believe me. The other extreme is they're not wearing masks and they're not abiding by distancing and they're not caring about it. I was going through uh, uh, Harlem, for example, and to see a friend and I was shocked that uh, People are gathered in huge numbers in corners. And I'm like, what happened here? Nobody's wearing masks, I said to my friend. And this is the community that is affected the most and large number of people are dying within the colored uh, and uh, African-American communities. So um, there is the happy medium, which is the middle not one extreme where you're totally paranoid and you're isolating yourself and you haven't seen the sun or at fresh air. The other extreme who uh, think everything is above them, they're not gonna get COVID and this is not a, a serious disease and they don't care about it. They're rebelling really. But anyway, with every issue we have extremes, but we always invite people to come to the center and to exercise their human rights 
to measure their safety um, uh, measurement would be different to e for each person. For example, if you had cancer treatment, then you would be a little bit more to the left of the spectrum um, or to the right to the extreme of the spectrum. The, if, if you are older and you have uh, other health conditions, then you may be a little more careful. But if you are a young person and you're able to uh, cope and you don't have any history of illnesses, you're protecting yourself with vitamin D3, vitamin C, zinc, and L-lysine and other uh, ginger and other things that I mentioned and you're strong, then follow the rules, mask, not just for you, but also protecting others and distancing physically, but still engaging with one another. For example, we had the uh, Zoom lecture, uh, five people decided to come in where we had a big space, they could be six feet apart, and the rest of the people who did not want to come had physical or other health conditions joined us through Zoom. So we need to be flexible and we don't need to uh, have one strict rule where terrifying everyone that everyone has to stay home. Uh, it's no longer as, as strict as that. We no longer need to isolate ourselves. We can put our mask and move on and do as much as we can within the limits of physical distancing. Dr. Ani Kalaji, and we're gonna to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for sharing with us. We're gonna do our best to stay healthy and to stay safe. Thank you for your contribution. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Remember, when one helps another, both become stronger. That's Let's right. help one another. Dr. Ani Kalaji, and thank you so much for being with us here on the social justice forums. Yes, we will give you that information. Stay connected to us, that you can be connected to Dr. Ani and all the great work that she is doing. We'll be back. We've got more on the social justice forums coming up after this. We know that people are dealing with the health crisis, but there's also a lot of food insecurity. We're giving out healthy food options, and that's what's key here. If you're a senior, you have a disability, they'll actually deliver meals to you. The residents are anxious, they're worried, they're scared, they want to be tested. When things were happening in our community, and, and we couldn't get the help. And there's almost a presumption of criminality that, that attaches to your skin color. The site will prioritize those who are at highest risk in the population. If you feel symptoms and you'd like to visit one of these COVID-19 testing sites here in the Bronx, you may call the State Health Department hotline. Important to note about this site is no reservations are needed. This is a walk-in clinic. A lot of us are out of work and looking for something to do. We have the machinery and the skills to make large scale of these masks and gowns. Take care of your people. It's going to go way further than we actually can understand. Right now, employees like myself are just adjusting to the new reality. And welcome back. During the COVID-19 pandemic, individuals across the nation have been suffering from loss and grief, many at record numbers. Those situations leave many people finding it very difficult to find joy amidst such trials as well as adversities. In the area of social justice, there can be no lasting social justice without the discussions about how we experience pain, whether in ourselves or in each other, and in the wider world. And our next guest is here to talk a little bit about that. She's a collaborating author in an anthology that's actually focused on real talk about love, loss, grief, and healing. We're here to provide her point of view on the matter. I'm joined by the collaborating author for the book, Finding Joy in the Journey, and program manager at Roberta's House Family Grief Support Center in Baltimore and Prince George's County, Maryland, Yolanda Michelle Nelson Swain. And we're glad to have you here. Good to be with us. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. Good. So as we talk a little bit about what's going on right now, obviously the nation was reeling, and we know the nation was reeling behind the death of George Floyd. Uh, as we've been talking throughout the course of this show, also the death of George of Jacob Blake, which really puts another nail in the coffin, another knife in the back, if you will, in the hearts of a community that's already traumatized. So. Give us a little bit about what you feel people are feeling in this time. 
honestly, I think people um, are feeling anger. Um, some people are feeling a sense of hopelessness. Um, people are just at a loss. Um, they are looking for um, ways to deal with this, ways to um, express how they're feeling. Um, there's just a, a, a plethora of emotions that people are dealing with or going through at this particular time in our country, in our world, actually. And when we talk about the pandemic, you know, we talk about a plethora of issues uh, dealing with COVID-19. And yeah. particularly in the African-American community, we know those numbers uh, affect more in communities of color than anywhere else across the country. Uh, what are you hearing in regards to the loss, the grief, and the trauma that people are feeling? Um, again, because it's so um, much, it's so much in our uh, communities of color, um, and there's so much loss, especially when, when I'm in the Baltimore area and in Prince George's County, um, people um, are dealing with grief in itself. But with it being the COVID situation, the pandemic, it's making it even more um, strenuous or it's exacerbating the grief that they're experiencing. So with that, they're not being able to experience um, the being with their loved one when they transition. They're not able to um, have that funeral that they normally would have. So on top of that, they are not able to share their grief with other family members because of the COVID um, situation. So they're dealing with isolation, they're dealing with loneliness, they're dealing with, um, um, there's rising numbers in suicide rates, there's rising numbers in um, alcoholism and drug abuse, all related to um, this loss and having to kind of cope um, by themselves. Um, because of the isolation, because of what's taking place with COVID-19. So it's actually, um, it's heightening, um, even post-traumatic stress disorder, um, all kinds of symptoms and, and other things that are, um, anxiety, that's another thing um, that is, that's happening because of this. Yeah. So you got a book, uh, Finding Joy in Your Journey. And for many people, this is a journey. Um, and trying to make sense out of it. I hear people say all the time, 2020, I wish I could put an eraser to it. Uh, we can just go straight to 2021. But the reality is we're still here. We're going to have to live through it. We're going to have to deal with it. But I know that you've got a part of uh, finding joy in your journey. So walk us a little bit through that. So what it is, is an, it's an anthology of, of individuals who um, wanted to just share um, people are sharing their own personal grief journey, um, how they were able to overcome some of the obstacles that they faced while grieving, um, what things, uh, coping skills they use, mechanisms that they use to get through. Um, grief is just that, it is a journey and everybody's journey is different. No one's grief is the same. We all grieve differently. We all grieve in our own time frame, in our own manner. And so, um, this book is um, just out there to help people understand that what they're feeling, what they're dealing with, what they're going through is normal. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing wrong with you. Um, some people, like I said, their grief looks different than yours. And so a lot of times people feel that something's wrong with them or that they're not grieving right. There's no right or wrong way to grieve. Um, we're all individuals, we're all unique. And so it's gonna look different. Um, and so we just wanted to try to give people some, some ways to help cope with the grief that they may be experiencing, help them understand that it's a normal process. And it is a journey. It is work. Grief is work. And mm -hmm. so you have to be willing to put in that work. If you want to get to your healing, it's going to take some time. It's going to take some effort. Um, and you really do have to do the work, but it is possible. And we want to just instill in people or let them know that there is hope and that you can find joy after a loss. And that loss doesn't have to be just loss to uh, death. Um, going back to this whole pandemic, people have lost their jobs. People have um, lost their sense of social, you know, being able to socialize with friends and family. And so that can be um, very discouraging. And so we just want to provide a little hope and let people know that that you can get through it. Yeah. I think sometimes when you talk about grief, that 
a lot of people want to put a timetable to it, right? They they feel yeah. like I only should be having to do this for a couple mm -hmm. of weeks, maybe a month, and I'll get back to it. But, you know, I know for myself, I thought that I was good, and then I wasn't. I found out for a long period of time. It took years and still, yeah. you know, to overcome. But for us in our community, uh, grief and then also counseling does not go hand in hand. We deal with our grief, we keep our grief to ourselves, but then when it comes to counseling and getting that help with the grief, we're not always, as a community of color, the first people to go and seek help. You're absolutely right. And I think, um, I, think I, I see a little shift in that. It is starting to uh, change a little bit as people are becoming a little more educated and understanding that you can't do it alone. Um, and that there are people out there who, who understand and who can help you to um, peel back the onion. Um, I think we're taught, and I, I can only speak for myself, we're taught that what goes on our house, in our house stays in our house. And so we have to break that norm and, and say, okay, um, I need a little bit more. I need a little bit more help and I, and I need to seek support. It's okay, as I was saying before, um, it's okay to feel the way you're feeling. Sometimes people are feeling angry. Sometimes people um, are feeling depressed. Whatever those feelings and emotions that you're experiencing are normal, it's okay. And it's okay to seek assistance or to seek help or support um, in navigating that. Navigating it is such a, such a hard thing, but give us some tips, if you will, on what are some of the best ways that a person can overcome because, um, a lot of people walk with it, um, they live with it, uh, they take it out on other people, um, they engage in behaviors that are contrary to who they are, um, and all of a sudden you find yourself trying to wrestle and overcome something, um, but really not knowing how do I get out of this? So um, give us some help on how to get out. Um, number one, seek some support. There are many support groups out there, um, as with the agency that I work with, Roberta's House, we're a nonprofit. And so there are services out there that don't require insurance, don't require payment. Um, you can join a support group. Um, find other individuals who have also lost someone to be able to find that um, connection. Um, a lot of times when you lose someone, you feel like nobody understands. But really, there are many other individuals who are also dealing with it on their own. So you can find under other individuals who have also experienced the loss. Um, when you're trying to cope, we also stress journaling. Um, get a journal and write down all of those things that you're dealing with, you're experiencing, get them out. Um, because when you hold it in, that's when you do um, just, you're like a ticking, uh, ticking time bomb. And so someone could just say one thing and it could be that day and you just explode. Um, so you wanna find an outlet. Um, a lot of people journal, a lot of people listen to music, take a walk, just find some other activities that help you to um, be able to release what you're feeling on the inside. Yeah. I know you wrote an article recently and uh, talking about having hate in your heart. Uh, share with us a little bit about that article because I found that to be very powerful and telling about um, where we are today as a society. Sure. Um, that was actually my, my first blog. And it was right after the George uh, Floyd incident. And I just had so many different emotions going on. And it's, um, it caused me to reflect and, and think about how um, we as um, African Americans have uh, endured so much and um, how we continue to push and we continue to go on um, and start. And I started thinking, um, the title is To Hate or Not to Hate. And so um, being that I'm a Christian, of course, I'm not supposed to have hate in my heart, but I had to question that, like, when I, when I think about it, how do I really feel? And I can understand how people um, can uh, develop hate in their heart because of all the um, things that we've endured as a race of people um, and just because of the color of our skin. And so I just started writing and, and, and writing some different incidents and things that have happened um, across this world, across this country to people of color and um, just wanted to pose a question. Um, should you feel hate? How do we get past this? How do we 
deal with this? How do we grow? How do we overcome some of the uh, things that we have endured and, and still remain positive and still remain productive citizens of this country in which we are, we are a part of? And when we talk about where we are today, obviously we talk a little bit about George Floyd in the beginning and then Jacob Blake. What are you hearing from people right now? I mean, as, as you saw that video, um, and you know what we're seeing now is more and more uh, what I say murders on video, and they're being captured on video. What do you say? What do you feel uh, after watching a video like that again? And to be honest with you, I have not. I I I didn't even watch the George Floyd video. I could not. Um, I cried, I, I literally sat and cried um, because I have two sons. Um, and so it just hurts my heart. And I couldn't bring myself to watch the video. I saw some pictures, but I, I didn't. Um, but it, it just right, it just brings up so many different emotions and feelings. And that's what people are experiencing. Like I mentioned, anger. Um, a lot of people have questions like, why? Why is this continuously happening? What Will there ever be justice? What do we have to do to um, be treated just like anyone else in this country? Why do we have to keep um, dealing with these same situations over and over again? So there's a lot of questions and, and sometimes there's no answers that we have to provide. But then we also have um, uh, the protests and, and, and um, people making sure that they vote. Those are important things that I think that will hopefully um, bring about change to what's what's happening in our country. Yeah. So for people who want to get connected with your writing, your work, how do they go about finding out? Sure. Um, my website is soulforreal.com. It's www.soulforreal.com. That's the website where you are able to um, purchase the book and also the blog is there. Um, my email is uh, Yolanda Michelle at Gmail. It's Y O L O N D A Michelle with two L's. And I'm also on Facebook and Instagram. And it's I, um, I am Soul For Real at Facebook and Instagram. And what do you hope that people take away from your writing and your work? I mean, everybody has a hope that, you know, when you're engaging in writing and you're, you've got readers out there who are taking a look at your stuff. What do you want people to take away from the work that you do? Um, I really want people to look inside of themselves. And that's why I came up with the name Soul For Real. And, and the um, tag is, it's about the soul for real. Um, and mm. I think people really need to look inside of themselves and, and really take inventory of who they are and who they were created to be. And I just really want people to... Um, just do, I, I, positivity is what I, I guess I want to put out there. I just want to put out some positivity and people to really look inside of themselves and just um, be able to care about their neighbor or look out for their neighbor. Um, make a change in this world in a positive way. Yeah, yeah. And lastly, uh, for those who may need some help, obviously navigating the season, COVID-19, social unrest, political unrest, all these things that people are really dealing with right now, what advice do you have? My advice um, would be to um, really just um, do whatever you can to put some positivity in our world, to um, look out for your neighbor, look out for your loved ones, make sure that um, you know we're checking on them, make sure that we are doing what we can um, to make a positive change, to deposit something um, in this world that can help make a change. Um, that's really my goal and that's my hope for people. Even though it looks um, dismal, even though it looks like um, things are going downhill, um, just keep that positive frame of mind, um, look for support, we are helpers one to another. And so that's my, my encouraging word is to, to do what you can for someone else and, and, and be a positive light. Yolanda Michelle Swain, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Good, thank you. And listen, we want to tell our viewers, listen, stay with us. We do have more show, more to discuss. I'm going to introduce you to a young person 
and an organization that's making a difference in the lives of young people when we return right here on the Social Justice Forum. It looks bleak. It feels bleak. But the city isn't shut down because our public services keep working in spite of and in the face of the dangers. We can count on them. And to keep them working and funded now and in the future, we need to be counted. Self-respond now to the 2020 Census at my2020census.gov. We built a media network for you. Bronxnet TV. Come learn in your new state-of-the-art studios at Lehman College. At Mercy College. And coming soon to the South Bronx in the Hub. Inspire with your stories, culture, history. Your Bronx on Bronxnet. Engage with us. Connect with us at your channels and at Bronxnet.tv. Learn. Engage. Inspire. Bronxnet TV. From the Bronx to the world. <laughs> Bronxnet. <laughs> Black and brown students have highly been affected by systematic oppression for decades. Students have not only faced the brutality of the police, but they're continuously denied educational opportunities crucial for their development. Oliver Scholars prepares high achieving black and Latino students from underserved New York City communities for success at top independent schools, as well as prestigious colleges. Oliver Scholars provides crucial support for scholars so that they can realize their full potential and ultimately give back to the city in which they live, as well as the nation and the world. Joining us now to provide a little bit more on their view of the matter, I'm joined by the Chief Program and Equity Officer for Oliver Scholars, Dr. Deidre Franklin, and also student at Phillips Academy, Andover, Jaden Collins, and a welcome here to the Social Justice Forums. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And so I'll start with you first, Dr. Franklin, when we talk about the Oliver Scholars Program, um, we know that there is this educational gap that particularly affects, you know, African Americans, communities of color. But Oliver Scholars does something in terms of bridging that gap and actually pushing them towards, a, you know, a higher level of achievement. Yeah, I mean, what we know at Oliver is many of our young people um, are in communities that um, schools, the schools in their communities might not serve them to the best, um, the, the best way that they can. And so with that, you know, we identify young people who are high achievers and might not be receiving the resources that they need within their community, within their school community to actually thrive. Um, many of our students do very well in school and are many times bored within their schools. And so Oliver wants to identify those young people, get them um, strengthened, and then have them apply to top uh, private schools here in the city as well as around the country. And Jane, you're a part of the Oliver Scholars Program. Talk to me about your participation and what it feels like to be an Oliver Scholar. Yeah, being an Oliver Scholar comes with so many benefits. You uh, always have a community behind you, and they, they provide you with so many resources, so, so many academic uh, opportunities, and many community service opportunities that really just help get you to that next level in your academic career. And just being a better, what it means to be like a scholar. And that helped me particularly because uh, the, the rigor and the community that came with Oliver Scholars helped me get to the high school that I ended up being at, which was Phillips Academy Andover, and it helped me thrive there as well. And uh, Dr. Franklin, when we talk about the work that goes on with these young students, um, obviously these are high achievers, but even though they're high achievers, uh, they literally have to go through this rigorous, rigorous program. So give us a little bit about the, the, the rigors that they go through, uh, because this is no easy walk in the park. No, it's not actually. And as you stated, the students are high achieving students. However, the schools um, in which they hope to matriculate into um, have a very different way of engaging young people, which is actually interesting. And so part of our 14 month program, first and foremost, is to get the young people up and running to be able to take the entrance exam. So in essence, they're taking an SAT type exam 
um, in the eighth grade. And then um, after they take the exam, we engage them in all sorts of STEM programming, uh, coding, language programs, in an effort to really have them understand ways to critically analyze the world that they're you know, moving through. That it's not as simple as giving them uh, an article to read and um, sort of reflect back to the teachers that they're actually reading articles and they're analyzing, they're annotating um, and getting ready to be able to actually matriculate into these schools. Um, most of the schools have kids who have been in the schools since kindergarten. And so those young people um, have the resources and have already been, um, been engaged in this type of sort of academic engagement. Jaden, when we talk about the rigors of the program, um, I use the word, the struggle is real. How real is the struggle? The struggle is real, especially <laughs> at Oliver, because once you get in to Oliver, that's when it really begins for you and your academic career. I think what is special about the program is that it forces you to take that next step in, um, in your academic thinking and your critical thinking as well. And like before, before when you were in your regular uh, school, you would receive all like these assignments, you do it, ace it. But when you enter Oliver, it re you're not just receiving, you also have to give yourself to the program and really um, find that scholar within yourself. And that takes a lot of, <laughs> of hard work and dedication that you didn't really have to use beforehand because everything would just come naturally. Um, so yeah, that's when it became rigorous and the constant pressure on us to do better and unlock the potential uh, that we had was, um, it was very rigorous. So the struggle was real. Yeah. Dr. Franklin, what is the message that you give to young people when they enter the Oliver Scholars Program? Because as we said, um, you're getting ready to prepare them for a high level of achievement, but not just a high level of achievement, um, you're really looking for them to perform at that next level uh, when it's talking about college and then on in the world. So share with us a little bit about the message that you give to uh, these young people. I mean, I think first and foremost, we let them know that they are deserving, um, that they are valued, and everybody who's a part of the program, as far as the staff is concerned, has extremely high expectations of the young people. And Jaden can probably speak to the fact that we don't let them just get away with stuff. We are pushing, we're pushing, we're pushing. And interestingly enough, part of our strategy is to push them so that they fail. And many people say, why would you want the young people to fail? Well, we want them to fail because they have to learn how to recover from failure. That's a big part of being successful is recovering from failure. And many of these young people have not failed. As Jaden said, they ace everything all the time. And when they matriculate into these um, schools, which are predominantly white schools, we want them to move into that school first and foremost, knowing who they are, um, what they bring, and being proud of that and moving through the environment um, as a scholar, as a leader, and someone who is really committed to their community and giving back to their community. So there's a lot of components that go into the program that's not just the academic pieces. We do a lot of sort of social and emotional pieces to fortify the young people as well. And when we talk about the educational gap between African Americans uh, and those, uh, you know, those other students, uh, and particularly white students, we know that the numbers don't lean in favor. Talk to us about underserved, you know, students at this time, and what really we don't understand about the educational gap when it comes to African Americans uh, and communities of color when it comes to education. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, it's about access. It's about access, it's about resources. Um, and many of those resources are not necessarily, you know, books and computers. Yes, you absolutely need that. But there are resources that the young people need. We need to fill them up. Um, we need to make sure that they're strong enough to persevere and persist within many of the academic institutions that they go through. So whether they're going to um, a top 
public school like a Stuyvesant or a Bronx High School of Science, or if they're going to the Dalton School or Phillips um, Andover, you know, they have to believe in themselves so that they can keep moving forward. You can be bright as you want to be, but if you don't believe in yourself, then inevitably you're going to have a lot of hiccups that could potentially put you in you know, a bad space. And what we know out here in, in society, you know, for black and brown kids, there's not a lot expected of them. And so you've got to sort of fight against the systemic pieces, you know, that, that our kids are up against in order to make sure that they have the tools they need to, to, to be successful. And, and they can, and they are. And Oliver has proven that. And Jaden, for you, talk to me about what you feel like. What do, what do you feel like now being an Oliver Scholar, going through the rigors of the program? Um, you know, you're, you're up against, and sometimes you're the only brown-skinned person in the room. What does it feel like going up against uh, those, or those who don't look like you? Do you feel equal? Do you feel, how do you feel? Um, I think in our current climate, it, it would be, I would be lying to say that I I feel like I'm on the same playing field as um, the white uh, the white students that I uh, learn with. But when but when you have a program like Oliver, it comes with resources like mentorship, and I think mentorship and a sense of community is very um, essential when it comes to learning because then you feel like you have a place and you feel like you belong there, and when you look when you look back at how you got into the high school through Oliver and through the rigorous events, it is very easy to just lift yourself up and say, "No, I deserve to be here." Even though the uh, white students in my class can, like, they have resources, they have a plethora of opportunities. I know that I deserve my place there because of the challenges I went through and fighting against the uh, systemic oppression, as you said before. Yeah. And systemic racism is what we know occurs in the educational system. And I know Oliver Scholars is doing a good job of making sure that our young people really give back, not just to the city and the country that they live in. Talk to us about that give, get, give back component, uh, Dr. Franklin, because you're encouraging them to better themselves, but then you're also encouraging them to, to also take uh, their rightful place in society. Right. I mean, a big piece of what differentiates Oliver Scholars from programs similar to um, them is our uh, social justice community service component. Um, and by community service, we mean in service of others. Um, it's not necessarily going to the food pantry during Thanksgiving, although we do that as well. You know, it's really understanding that you have been given a gift. And as a result of being given that gift, it behooves you to be able to give back and to uplift and to pull up. That's the components that we try to encourage in our young people. You know, as you move through high school, as you move through college, as you move through life, it's on you to be able to continue to pull up and push people forward as someone did to you. So community service can be defined in a host of ways, and we do all of it. But I think the key piece there is to understand that you did not do this alone. You had a whole village, and as Jaden said, a community with you and behind you. And it's, it's your responsibility to make sure, whether it's with Oliver or anywhere else, um, that, that you continue and, and, and keep the tradition going. How does one go about becoming an Oliver Scholar? I think our viewers are probably saying, wow, this is a prestigious group of young, young people, but how does my young person have the opportunity to possibly be, potentially become an Oliver Scholar? So we have multiple ways of becoming an Oliver Scholar, actually being nominated. So um, guidance counselors and schools nominate, um, families nominate, and you can also nominate your child yourself if you go to the website, oliverscholars.org. Um, and fill out a nomination form. And then um, we typically get a year, you know, per year about a thousand applicants. And out of that um, 1,000, we choose 70. And mm -hmm. that application process opens up um, in the fall. 
And we began reviewing applications around January to figure out who we will bring in to interview. So there's an interview process after the application process. And for people who say how long this process takes um, in terms of being engaged in the program, participating in the program, talk to us about the duration and the length of the program. So the program is actually 14 months, but this is after you spend maybe six or seven months in the interview process. So you're in the interview process in the seventh grade. And then in the summer between the seventh and eighth grade is when you begin the process. You start the process in that first summer. Um, and then you go into a Saturday Academy all through your eighth grade. So they're not only doing uh, their regular school, they're also going to our Saturday Academy all day from nine to three every Saturday. Uh, September through June, and then they go into their second summer. Once they've been accepted into their um, respective schools, they go into their second summer of uh, rigorous academic programming, and then we have our graduation. And the graduation is, is a celebration of accomplishing the 14 months, but the relationship doesn't stop there. We continue to follow our young people through their high school um, experience to make sure that they have what they need and um, that they're successful. Yeah. And so Jaden, uh, for you, as you've taken the mantle and been a participant in the program, talk to us about what it feels like now, um, having been a participant and what you would say to anyone else who might be coming in uh, as a word of advice. Um, I am grateful for the opportunity that I was given. As Dr. Franklin said, it was a gift and what it really it's really special because you get to take advantage of that gift and uh, help others when you become an Oliver Scholar you're not suddenly a part of you know you're not suddenly on the same playing field as uh, uh, white students or you're not suddenly bridging that educational gap you have to take advantage of the opportunity you, you were given and provide back to your uh, um, environment and your community. And I, I think a word of advice is don't be scared, um, like don't, don't be terrified of the rigor and the, the stress that comes with it because once you get through the, those challenges, stuff at, the, um, stuff at like your high school and college and beyond, it becomes much easier for you. It becomes um, just, it becomes a second nature to be able to cope with many challenges that you might face throughout your career. Well, Jaden and Dr. Franklin, thank you so much for sharing about the Oliver Scholars Program. Congratulations, Jaden, on the great work that you're doing and Dr. Thank Franklin you. for uh, imparting and impacting our young people in such a great way. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you for having us. Great. Well, we have come to the end of our show. We hope that you've enjoyed today's Bronx Social Justice Forums. We encourage you to stay connected to us as you can find out more information every week as we delve into the issues of social justice as well as community engagement. Now, if you want to join in the conversation, you're more than welcome to anytime. Go to our social media page at BronxNet TV and join us next week where we will continue to elevate the discussion and bring you some more news, some more information, and some more people who are making a difference. For the Social Justice Forums, I'm Darren Jaime saying take care. God bless.